Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I see that I'm not like the bishop who turned up in a country church. And he ascended the pulpit stairs, and he looked over the pulpit, and he saw three elderly ladies sitting way down at the back. And so he spoke to the minister of the church, who was just behind him, and said, did you tell them I was coming? And he said, no, but word seems to have got around. <laughs> I am greatly honored tonight to be invited for the first time to this university. I'm even more honored to have such a distinguished discussion partner in Dr. Michael Tooley. I met him for the first time in my life this afternoon, and we had a delightful conversation which was broken by having to come to this session tonight. <laughs> and I am so much looking forward to reading one of his books. He's excited me so much about his ideas on causation that I wish I had read them before we had our discussion. But anyway, <laughs> Dr. Truly, I hope you will be patient with me. Now, to every speaker that belongs a biography, I come from Northern Ireland. And of course, Northern Ireland has not had the best reputation as an advertisement for the Christian faith. My parents were very unusual. They were Christian without being sectarian. That was the first thing, and it cost my parents quite a lot in terms of terrorist bombings and things like that. So we know in our family what sectarian violence is all about. And yet we remain Christian. Secondly, they gave me the greatest gift that any parent can give, and that is they allowed me to think. And so it was that I left Ireland in 1962 and came to Cambridge to study mathematics. It was a wonderful time because some of you may have heard of C.S. Lewis. He was still there, and I went to hear the final lectures he ever gave. So I'm a bit of a dinosaur in terms of antiquity. <laughs> But that's the case, and I mention him because intellectually he was a wonderful mentor remotely through his books and through his writings. But in my first week at university, something happened that's relevant to tonight's topic. In my college at Cambridge, one of the students at dinner rather too loudly said to me, do you believe in God? And then he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have asked you that, you're Irish. <laughs> and all you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. Now, of course, I'd heard that before, but it, in a sense, set a compass bearing for my life. My parents are Christian believers. So were my grandparents and so were their parents. And so it's pretty obvious it's all to do with Irish genetics. <laughs> and that was something I wanted to be sure about because I knew that Christianity had at its heart truth claims. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth, not merely I say true things. And so it was important to me to do some practical experimentation. Uh, the sort of atheists we met in Ireland were either Protestant atheists or Catholic <laughs> atheists. <laughs> and so it was my great opportunity at Cambridge to meet genuine atheists and befriend them. That's the crucial thing. I discovered very early in life that talking to other people and befriending them produced a lot more than fighting them. I'd seen enough of fighting in my young days over ideologies. And so I was determined to get to know agnostics and atheists who didn't share my worldview and really enter try to enter into their world to discover why they believed what they believed, what their claims were, what the evidence base was for their convictions. And I've been doing it ever since. It became, in a way, a passion because I was advised after I'd done my doctorate that I ought to go to Germany to do some research, and that gave me the opportunity to learn the language. And therefore, I could speak and in the Cold War days, still a very long time ago, remember, I was able to go particularly to East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, where I could pass unnoticed 
and therefore interact with people who'd been systematically exposed to an atheistic philosophy. During those years, I became interested, because it was important for my field, in the mathematics done by the Russians. And I learned the language in order to translate it for the American Mathematical Society, to whom I owe a very small part of my salary in those early days. And so I was able, when the wall fell, to start going to Russia as a guest of the Academy of Sciences. My interest was still to talk to people who'd been absolutely suffused and permeated by an atheistic ideology. And I made many friends, in Siberia particularly, they actually gave me a two-way ticket to Siberia, <laughs> which is not always the case. And it was so interesting that even in the universities, when I'd finished my mathematics lectures, they would start asking me about God, because I was, well, one man described me, he says, you're like a green cow. I said, why? Well, green cows don't exist, and neither does your God. So that was a very formative period in my life. And gradually, as I began to discuss more and more, I began to talk more and more publicly about the relationship, particularly between my passion as a scientist and belief in God, because I discovered there was a whole big debate out there. And in recent years, I, I nearly said I made the mistake of debating Richard Dawkins, because that changed my life very dramatically. I had no idea that debating Dawkins, and he hadn't debated for quite some time, would lead to me being invited to places like your university tonight. And I have enjoyed immensely the interchanges just since I've been here this week with a distinguished ethicist last night in the University of Utah and so on. Because I really do believe that what our chairman has pointed out is very important. We can all learn from one another. One of my basic convictions, ladies and gentlemen, is that Every man and woman, no matter what they believe, is of infinite value. I believe it because I believe they're made in the image of God. And therefore, when we meet other people, the least we can do is to show them respect, even if we disagree with their worldview. Because in that way, we can explore and we can research the big ideas. And there should be no one in the world, whatever they believe, from whom we cannot learn something. So I am immensely privileged to have this opportunity tonight, and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion. One last point, it'll come up again. I'm interested in talking about reason and faith, because faith is seriously misunderstood in our society. And as a slightly provocative remark, I want to point out that you have to add faith in what? Because faith is essential to any science or philosophy. It is also essential in Christianity. And the crucial question one of them will be asking tonight, no doubt, is this. What is the evidence for what you believe? Is it evidence-based faith or is it, as Richard Dawkins says, blind faith? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, thanks very much, Matt, for the uh, kind introduction. And I want to say my special thanks to the Veritas Forum for uh, inviting me to take part tonight, and uh, especially in conversation with uh, Professor John Lennox. Um, I very much like the idea of having a conversation where we can interact uh, uh, with one another. I've been in a number of debates, and um, debates can be uh, very good, but can also be dissatisfying in various ways. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, touch very briefly um, on uh, my background, uh, so you know roughly uh, uh, where I'm coming from. And um, in the uh, discussion itself, I'll attempt to treat the conversation with John as in genuine conversation. So I'll try to uh, interact with him in the way I would interact with any of you if we were talking about 
uh, these questions of uh, uh, atheism and Christianity. So uh, I promise not to lapse into long lectures, many lectures or set, set uh, speeches and so on. And uh, also when John raises questions, I'll try to answer them in a brief way and then he can follow up and I can uh, expand on it. And so I think that should make for a very good type of uh, interaction. So let me begin by saying a bit about my background. Um, again, so you have a sense of where I've been and where I'm coming from. I grew up in a small rural community uh, in uh, Canada, uh, where not only all the members of my own family were Christians, but uh, so it appeared, uh, absolutely everyone in the uh, community in which I grew up. Um, I started going to Sunday school, which I did for a few years, and then uh, at the age of 12, I uh, joined the church. Uh, during almost all my teenage years, uh, it'd be true to say that I never had any doubts at all about the truth of Christianity. Um, I also had quite a strong sense of sin, uh, something I think at least at that time was not uncommon among uh, adolescents. And I had this together with, a, again, a very strong conviction that I very much needed the assistance of God and especially of Jesus uh, if I was going to be able to live uh, a Christian life. So, that's how things were through high school. I then went to university, and um, I had uh, some initial contact with uh, religious ideas because I had a friend of mine who was Catholic, and uh, he was going to St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, and there was a compulsory course called Religious Knowledge, which you took if you were a Catholic, and they were exposed to St. Thomas Aquinas' five arguments for the existence of God, and so I often got together with Paul and discussed those arguments. But though I did that, I never had any, again, never had any doubts about my own beliefs at that point. But then a good friend of mine, uh, we'd gone to elementary school together, and uh, who's a person who was genuinely interested in ideas, suggested to me at a certain point that uh, there was a book that I should read. And uh, the book that in question was uh, Marriage and Morals by the great British philosopher Bertrand Russell. And reading that book changed my life forever. Uh, when I finished the book, I realized the first time in my life that one can ask, why do I believe that? That one can ask, what evidence do I have for those beliefs? And when I asked those questions, I concluded that I didn't have good reasons for believing in God and that I didn't have good reasons for accepting Christianity. So, and this may be surprising, the result in my case was immediate. I no longer believed in God and I no longer uh, accepted Christianity. Um, this experience has led to uh, a lifelong interest in religion, continuing through graduate school where at Princeton University, I wrote my PhD dissertation in the area of philosophy religion. It was supervised by a man named Walter Kaufman, whose writings in philosophy religion, they included critique of religion, philosophy, and faith of a heretic, uh, I found extremely stimulating today, uh, then, and still admire very much today. Um, then when I started teaching, this would be 1967 at Stanford University, uh, my main area of concentration was, again, philosophy of religion. I didn't want to publish things in that area. And in 2008, I had the opportunity to uh, involve, get involved in a debate volume, it's entitled Knowledge of God, with one of the very foremost uh, Christian philosophers of our time, uh, Alan Plantinga, who was at Notre Dame at the time, but uh, had been earlier at Calvin College. Uh, in that debate volume, I really focused on what I thought was the most important consideration uh, bearing upon the existence of God, uh, what's known as the argument from evil, which I'll be talking about uh, more as we go on. So let me say a bit about why I think these sorts of conversations are important. Um, first of all, I think it's important from a sort of societal point of view. There are in this society, in most societies, significant disagreements about how society should be organized, about what laws there should be, about what sorts of things are right and wrong. These disagreements can, in many cases, generate considerable stress within the society and can lead to rather unhappy uh, divisions. These differences are often rooted in religious differences, and uh, as a result, it may be difficult to resolve these disagreements unless one is willing to look at the underlying uh, religious differences. Second, reason that these things are important is that uh, a matter of the significance of religious beliefs. It's seeming important that one have beliefs that are reasonable beliefs in the light of the total evidence. 
And so the question is, to what extent do people have beliefs that are reasonable in the light of the total evidence? And uh, here's a way of thinking about it. Um, in the world, there are many religions, uh, often putting forward incompatible beliefs and claims and so on. And uh, these are not just about trillion matters, but about some of the most important issues that there are. But all, of all these many religions, only one, at most, can be the one true religion, if such there be, uh, and, or even the close approximation to the truth. The vast majority of religious believers, uh, John talked about sort of a genetic basis for certain sorts of beliefs and so on, right? The vast majority of religious believers, however, have religious beliefs that are very closely related to the beliefs of their parents. What does it mean? Well, it means if one is a religious, religious believer, unless you've taken the time to look at the alternatives, to consider alternative religions and also atheism, right? Um, it means that uh, unless one has very, uh, been very lucky indeed, it's actually likely that your religious beliefs are incorrect and that you're accepting the wrong religion just because of the number of religions that there are in the world. So it's important that one's be justified in accepting the religious beliefs that one does to subject those beliefs to careful, close, uh, critical scrutiny. And one of the things that I think is extremely helpful uh, in doing that is to be engaging in conversations with thoughtful and intelligent people who disagree with one. Okay, I think that's absolutely crucial, right? I think it's very bad just to speak, isolate one in a circle of those who share one's beliefs, right? It's important to step outside of that circle to talk to people who don't share your beliefs, to ask them why they accept different beliefs and why they disagree with your beliefs. So in conclusion, in short, is that what one believes in the area of religion, I think, is extremely important, since the truth or falsity of religious beliefs uh, has enormous relevance. It has relevance first to how it's rational to live your life. It has relevance to how one ought to live one's life. It has relevance to how society should best be organized and it also has relevance to how we can best live together uh, with other people. So I'm very much looking forward to tonight's uh, discussion with uh, John Lennox. Well, and with that, we will begin our conversation. Gentlemen, the framework for this evening is to get a better sense of kind of your core beliefs and how they shape your life and your experiences. Our first topic is a focus on belief in God from a Christian perspective and from an atheist perspective. Begin our first question for Professor Lennox. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it means to be a Christian? We want to start our discussion by kind of defining some of our key terms and making sure we understand what we mean when we use these terms Christianity and atheism. So can you begin by just sharing a little bit about what Christianity means to you, what you mean when you say you're a Christian, and in light of your personal view, how does that shape what you believe about God? Well, to summarize it as rapidly as possible, Christianity is a worldview. It is a monotheistic worldview. In other words, it does not believe that mass energy is all that exists. It believes that there is a transcendent and personal God who created space-time, who created the universe, and who upholds it. It also believes that God has revealed at least part of who he is in the natural world. And that's why I'm particularly interested in the relationship of science to Christian belief. But you ask specifically about Christianity, and of course the word Christian comes from Christ, and this is geared into history, so it's no longer a matter of thinking about science with its generalized laws and the universe as a whole. It's talking about something very specific and historical. And the claim is, and it is a staggering claim, that God has become human. And Jesus Christ was simultaneously man and God. And the reason for his coming is explained by his name, Jesus. You will call his name Jesus for he will save you from your sins. Now these are big concepts and they need unpacking, but I'm trying to summarize. I believe that the evidence base is mainly, but not only, 
in the life, the miracles of Jesus, and supremely by his death and resurrection from the dead, which I take as a fact of history for which I believe we can give substantial evidence. But I would emphasize that being a Christian does not mean simply accepting these facts intellectually, but it means entering into a real and personal relationship with God, because God, ladies and gentlemen, is not a theory, he's a person. He's a person who can be related with him. Because we are created in his image, we can have a relationship with him. And I believe that the heart of it is that he died and rose again to give me something utterly unique. I, I was very interested, Michael, that you're talking about these multiple religions, and I agree with you. And one of the utterly unique things to my mind in Christianity, it doesn't compete with any other religion on this point because no other religion offers this, is the knowledge of forgiveness and peace with God in this life that's based not on merit or performance, but is based on something God has done and is received as a free gift through repentance. Now, I'm using technical terms like anything, and you may resent that, but you've asked me to um, <laughs> explain it. So, it seems to me that that's a very short summary of it. Michael, I was, I was really very interested in your story, and thanks for sharing mm -hmm. it with us. I was most interested that Bertrand Russell played a key point, mm -hmm. and I can't help sharing this. I remember walking around Cambridge, and I came to a bookshop, and in the window was a book by Bertrand Russell, Why I Am Not a Christian. And I thought, dare I read it? <laughs> dare I read it? And I'd been taught to, to think, and I, I, I so echo what, what Michael said, I had been taught by my parents to criticize Christianity. My father gave me a copy of the Communist Manifesto when I was 14 and said, you better read that. <laughs> so I grew up with a very critical view of my face. So I circled the bookshop and I circled it. Can I really afford the money to buy this? And I bought it. And I'm glad I did because it was one of the most profound confirmations of my Christian faith that I'd read. <laughs> so <laughs> Bertrand Russell has played an equal and opposite role for the two of us. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Professor Tooley, similar question. You know, as we see on the screen, atheism and Christianity, we heard a brief explanation of how we are to understand Christianity mm -hmm. for this conversation. Help us understand atheism. How should we think about that term? What does it mean to you? Well, uh, start with the term theism, okay? Uh, the term theism is sometimes used in a very general way to cover uh, a belief in any old sort of deity, be it good, bad, or indifferent, right? And I don't think that use of the term theism is advised, okay? So uh, I want to use the term theism to refer to a belief in a deity that has certain striking characteristics. I mean. First of all, uh, it's an all-powerful deity. Secondly, it's an all-knowing deity. And third, it's a deity that has moral characteristics. It's not bad or indifferent, right? It's good, indeed, perfectly good from a moral point of view, right? Now, I mean, Christians would want to include a number of other properties, right? But I just want on a minimum definition, right? And so theism is the view that there is a, an omnipotent that is all-powerful, omniscient, that's all-knowing, uh, and morally perfect. Uh, person uh, in existence, right? Atheism is the view that uh, there is no such person. There is no omnipotent, omniscient, uh, and morally perfect person, right? And um, so when I'm an atheist, say I'm an atheist, that's what I'm saying. Now, there are conceptions of powerful deities that, so to speak, create the universe and then wander off. Deism is a label for these, right? And so. Uh, the sort of argument that I would bring, main argument I bring against theism, known as the argument from evil, which we'll talk more about later, right, just doesn't have much bite in the case of deism, right, because the idea of being perfectly good is not built into a deistic deity, right. So um, uh, that's essentially my uh, take on atheism, right. And as I say, my reason for being an atheist, I don't know if you want me to go into it at this point or... I think we have a little time for that. Sure. Okay. So, I mean... Uh, I mean, for example, quite recently, uh, there was a typhoon that hit the Philippines. Mm. And the result was the death of 10,000 people. And these were not 10,000 serial killers. These were 10,000 ordinary men, women, children, 
and babies, right? Now, suppose that you were all-powerful, or even if you're much, much less than all-powerful, right? You could have intervened in the weather. You could have done something to stop that typhoon. And if you'd done so, there would have been 10,000 fewer reasonably innocent people who wouldn't have died, in some cases, quite horrible deaths and so on, right? And so it's quite natural to say, if there is an all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good being, right? Uh, why wouldn't he intervene in this sort of situation, right? And so arguments from evil are arguments that focus upon that sort of suffering, uh, horrendous evils in the world, sometimes committed by people like Hitler and Stalin and so on, right? And uh, argue in the best form of the argument that that's evidence against the existence of God. Now, what I did in the book I did with Plantinga, I tried to formulate the argument in a rigorous way. I won't describe it here because we don't want people falling asleep, right? Uh, but I tried to show that you could actually calculate the probability that uh, when these omni-deities existed and so on, given the number of evils in the world, right? So I think the evidential argument from evil is a very powerful objection uh, to belief in the existence of God, and the Christian God is conceived of as having these properties, so it's a very powerful objection to the Christian God. Okay, thank you both. Would you like to, uh, before we move on to our next question, do we have perhaps uh, some clarifying questions for each other oh, about anything that was mentioned? Well, Michael, let me hasten to agree with you in the sense that this is the hardest question I face as a Christian without any, without any hesitation. I arrived in New Zealand two days after the earthquake, mm -hmm. and I had to meet people who had lost their husbands and so on. And it's on everybody's lips, and I confess right away that this is the hard question. I think there's a series of deep issues behind it, and I ha wasn't aware you'd written on it with Alan, and I shall certainly have a look at your detailed argument, but <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> um, it seems to me that we set up concepts of omnipotence, all-knowing, and so on. I notice that none of those words are used in the Bible, even though they are legitimate deductions to define God. But sometimes I think we make a set of assumptions and deductions from them that might not actually represent the truth. Now, I don't know how much we want to discuss this question. Now, I'll make one point and we can continue because it is the vital problem. Um, my first reaction is a philosophical one and it'll raise some of the questions down the line and it's this. We are all outraged by these things by both, as you say, the problem of natural evil, earthquakes, tsunamis, and moral evil, the Hitlers, and, and, and so on. And I have enormous sympathy for people who turn to atheism because of that problem. I've been in Auschwitz many times. I've wept every mm. time. And I have many friends who've lost all their relatives. But then I begin to think, and can I just say, Cancer looks very different to an oncologist than it does to a young mother who's just been told she's two months to live. And many of you sitting out there, you may be interested in this problem philosophically, but you may be deeply hurting. And it's very difficult in a conversation like this to handle both. But then I think, if, there, if you turn to atheism and say there's no God, in one sense you've solved the problem, but in what sense? Because you haven't removed the suffering, it's still there. What you have removed, of course, completely is any ultimate hope. Because the atheistic view denies that there is any life after death in which there could be any credible compensation. And thirdly, and this is the big philosophical one, as you know, I have a question. I, as you know, have debated and interacted with Dawkins. Dawkins' atheistic reaction and I'd be interested in your take on this, is to say, look, the universe is just like we'd expect it to be. At the bottom, there's no good, no evil. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. So he's removed morality. And it seems to me there's quite a strong argument around there that says, if you deny the existence of God, you remove morality. But then where does the outrage, where does the concept of evil come from? 
So that would be my first, but not my last comment on this. Right, so can I comment? Yeah, I mean, we, I, I think we have some time to uh, camp on this issue for a little bit. We certainly yes. wanted to get to deeper Came issues over. of morality no, and I'd values. love to hear Michael's response. Yeah, yeah, so why don't we call an audible here and keep this part of the conversation going. Uh, you've heard some thoughts All right. about this. Why don't we uh, engage that idea? Well, there's some points that come up that we can pursue further later on, okay? But uh, for one thing, um, uh, the, the claim that, you know, if you're an atheist, that removes value from the world. Uh, I mean, I have two colleagues who have written books on metaethics. Uh, one is Gray Maudy, who wrote a book, Value, Reality, and Desire. Uh, another is Mike Humer, who wrote an excellent book on ethical intuitionism, right? And uh, I believe that both of them are atheists. Uh, Graham was a Christian and so on, right? And so there are a number of philosophers uh, who are moral realists and so on, and uh, who are atheists. And Mike Humer, in his book, uh, takes a very strong look, a uh, very extended look at what's known as divine command theory morality, right? And argues that it doesn't uh, provide a satisfactory basis for uh, objective values. The other question concerns the relation between atheism and belief in a life beyond the grave. Okay, right? Now, I'll be quite frank, I don't think the chances of a life beyond the grave are very good. Okay? But not all atheists agree. I mean, if you think about Buddhism, for example, the Buddha was an atheist, right? And yet he believed in reincarnation, right? So uh, it's possible to be an atheist and have a different view in philosophy of mind than I have, to believe that. We have immaterial minds or souls. One might think, as I don't, there's a good philosophical argument for that. But the third point I want to make is that, um, I mean, if atheism is the case, and if as I myself think there's no life after death, right, then uh, you have this situation where people suffer horribly, and you know that, so to speak, that's never going to be recompensed and so on, right? But the question is whether your view puts things in a less bleak light, okay, right? And so the point is, it's not that, you know, uh, when you die, there's life beyond the grave, and that's great, right? I mean, Christianity, at the heart of Christianity is the idea of salvation, the idea that Jesus died for our sins, right? There's an alternative to salvation, right? Uh, in Orthodox Christianity, the alternative is uh, eternal punishment in hell, right? And moreover, there are passages in the New Testament, many are called, but few are chosen, broad is the way, and so forth and so on, right? that suggests that the majority of the human race are going to wind up in the wrong place. They're going to wind up in hell, right? And so the question is, is that a brighter picture? We'll take a vivid example. I mean, take the Holocaust, where six million Jews were killed, right? Uh, now, if I say, you know, it's very unlikely that those who are to a Jewish survival, very unlikely your friends and family um, are going to uh, ever live again, right? Death is the end, right? Uh, again, that's not a nice message, right? But if, on the other hand, I were to say, look, there's a heaven and hell, right? And so, you know, maybe your family wound up in, hell, in heaven, right? But again, if you accept the Christian message, I mean, Jesus said, those who believe in me and are baptized will be saved, and so on. Those who do not believe in me will be condemned, right? I think it's a bleaker message that you would be conveying to survivors of the Holocaust than... I would be conveying. Now, which point there do you want me to respond to? Because there's so much there that's of importance. Let me say a couple of things, because it's very important. Because I am so sympathetic to this reaction, because it's the reason many of my colleagues and friends have turned to atheism. So let me say just a couple of things. Firstly, you rightly say the heart of Christian gospel is salvation. Now, I look at that cross. Nietzsche said, this God who's on a cross, and he was mocking. But I say, God on a cross, if that really is God, what's he doing there? And my response is, at the very least, he has not remained distant from the problem of human suffering, but has himself become part of it. That's number one. Now, I take your points at the end, but I think there is a little bit of a danger of caricature. This business of heaven and hell and reward, we need to look into it a bit further because 
if you look at what the New Testament says about these things, it will come back to a concept that I have not yet used, but you will immediately pounce on it when I <laughs> use it. And that's the notion of free will. It seems to me that we say, could not a good God, a powerful God, have made a world in which these things weren't possible? But it seems to me that the existence of choice, which renders moral evil possible, is an original good. God has created men and women after his image. There is such a thing as love. That's only possible if there can be such a thing as hate. Now, the sad thing is, we have rebelled against God. And if we say, couldn't a good God have made a universe where these things didn't happen? Of course he could. But there would have been no humans in it. There would have been robots. Now, when I had a child, my first child, I remember holding the little girl and thinking, this child could grow up to rebel against me. That didn't stop me having children. And it seems to me that God takes a great risk in creating humans. Now, on your point, I would never talk in those terms to my Jewish friends because in the end I cannot tell the final dealings of a screaming person in the gas chambers. And I think God loves people much more than I do actually. And he will save all he can, but if someone having seen all there is revealed in Christ of his love, and says no, I would agree very much with C.S. Lewis, what is God to do? Is he to force that person? You can't force people to love you. So God has to accept the person who says no. Now we can dramatize all kinds of uh, middle-aged notions of hell and all the rest of it, but surely in one way, the grimness about it is that God honors the choice of the people who say no to him. And I do not see any alternative to that. But it's not the way I would talk to people. I noticed that Jesus talked about hell to religious bigots, which is quite a striking thing. And he did warn in the biggest statement of God's love I know of, for God so loved the world, as we know in John. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. In that very maximal statement of the love of God, there's the possibility of perishing. But it seems to me the logical concomitant of my saying no to God. If I say no to God, I expect if there is a God, he honors my choice. Otherwise, he's simply forcing us into belief. So that's the way I begin to approach that. Can I comment just very briefly? Yeah, your, your thoughts on, on free will, uh, the, the free will argument uh, that Professor Lennox has talked about. Well, I mean, uh, the thing is that, uh, I mean, our powers are limited, okay, right? And so um, even someone like Hitler, could, so to speak, couldn't impose great suffering on the whole human race, okay? Uh, his evils were limited in a certain sort of way. And so, um, uh, my view would be that one should ask uh, whether there shouldn't be somewhat stronger limits on what one is capable of doing, right? And so the idea is that you don't have to create a world with no free will in it, right? You can just limit the harm that will can inflict on other human beings, right? Now, you would perhaps agree with Richard Swinburne that what I want is sort of a toy world, right? Where we can't, so to speak, uh, inflict horrendous evils on other individuals, right? And it's true, that's the sort of world I want, but I don't think it's fair of Swinburne to characterize as a toy world, right? I think that we no. can still do any number of things that are very nasty to other people and so on, right? We can still be quite vicious individuals, right? Or we can be quite loving individuals, right? So I think there's, there can be enormous scope for uh, good and evil choices and so on in a world where um, our ability to inflict horrendous evil on people uh, is limited. But I want to address one other point. And so, I mean, you talked about respecting the individual's choice, right? But, I mean, this ties in with another Christian belief that I think is really very important and really needs to be thought about very carefully, right? And that's the idea that, you know, at some point in the future and so on, there's going to be a final judgment, right? And the crucial thing is it's a final judgment, right? And so God has set up the world in such a way that you have a limited amount of time in which to make your choice for Jesus or against Jesus, right? And when the bell rings and so on, when you die, right, 
uh, there's no more, there's no further opportunity, right? I, I prefer a God who didn't have such an early final examination, basically, right? Who allowed people to uh, live longer, to grow, to think about the alternatives and so on, right? But the situation is, you know, uh, I reject Jesus and so on, right? I die, I wind up in hell, right? When I get there, I may say, gee, this is not a great place and so on, right? But it's too late, right? And so uh, the question is, why should you set up the world like that, where one's fate is at a certain point determined in a way that's absolutely final? Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be the best way to uh, set up a world. Why don't we hold off on furthering that topic? We'll probably circle back in some of our final statements, and I imagine our audience will have some questions about that topic as well. Why don't we transition to another big question that consistently comes up in this topic of atheism and Christianity, and that is the relationship between science and religious belief. Uh, Professor Lennox, why don't we start with you? You raised this issue previously. Can you share a little bit about your thoughts on the relationship between science, empirical evidence, and religious belief? Are those things in conflict? Is there a complementary relationship we should explore? How can we understand this this relationship? Well, they're clearly not in conflict. That ought to be obvious at the deepest level. Peter Higgs won the Nobel Prize two or three weeks ago in Scotland. The Scots are all excited. For the discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN, he's an atheist, Peter. Mm -hmm. A few years back, Bill Phillips won exactly the same prize, and he's an evangelical Christian in the United States. Both Nobel Prize winners in physics, so what separates them? Their science? No. It's their worldview. The one is an atheist, the other is a Christian theist. And I think the most important thing to realize in this debate, it's not science versus God. It's theism and atheism as two worldviews and there are scientists on both sides. And each side attempts in different ways to harness science for its argument. Richard Dawkins claims that his Biology makes him an intellectually fulfilled atheist. I take the exact opposite view. And if I've asked for evidence, I look back at the history of science. It arose in the uh, 16th, 17th centuries under people like Galileo, Kepler, Newton, so on, Clark Maxwell, Babbage coming up into the modern times. They were all theists. They all believed in God. And that didn't hinder their science and uh, Alfred North Whitehead and so on and Merton and various other people up to this present day, the general consensus I believe among philosophers of science that I've read is, and I'll quote C.S. Lewis to summarize it, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature. Why? Because they believed in a lawgiver. So the motor that drove science in the 17th century was belief in God. Now the odd thing is now we're in the 21st century and people like Stephen Hawking most recently in his book claims you've got to choose between science and God. And if I could just take a moment to explain why I think that has happened. Partly it's sheer confusion about two things. One about the nature of God and two about the nature of science. Because I used to think when I used the word God and Michael has made the point for me that people thought of the God of the Bible, but they don't. You see, Stephen Hawking, for instance, and Lawrence Krauss think that I believe in a God of the gaps. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. And as science advances, the space for God disappears. Now, if you define God to be a God of the gaps, of course you have to choose between God and science, because that's the way you've defined God. But the God of the Bible is not the God of the things we don't understand. He's the God of the things we do and of the things that we don't. And, of course, the pioneers of modern science saw that very clearly. And that's why they didn't push God out of the picture. The second point is this, that the nature of explanation, I'm sure this is a field that Michael knows much more about than I do because philosophers have helped me greatly on this. We often think that science explains me. We may want to discuss the limitations of science. But you know, suppose, let me cut it down to its absolute basics. Let's have a Rolls-Royce turbojet engine here. And I offer you two explanations of it. One is aeronautical engineering and the basic laws of thermodynamics and turbo propulsion. 
Another explanation is Rolls and Royce. Choose. Well, anybody can see that's an absurdity. There are two different kinds of explanation. The first is in terms of law and mechanism, that's the scientific one. And the second is in terms of agency. And the confusion that I think is very deep in the minds of people like Richard Dawkins and so on, is that if you've got the scientific explanation, you don't need explanation at any other level. But that simply is false. And so my view of the universe is to say, well, to quote Richard Swinburne, and I agree with you at the point you made, but to quote him positively, <laughs> he said, science explains, I believe it explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains. So that there's a confusion about the nature of explanation. Now finally, and this is the big thing, if I'm asked what's the one main reason as a scientist I believe there's a God, it's the fact I can do science. Because the fundamental faith of any scientist, notice the word faith, as Einstein saw, is the belief that the universe is rationally intelligible in terms of mathematics. Now, I ask my atheist friend, and I'm not presupposing what Michael will say to me on this. <laughs> I asked my atheist friends up to this point in my life, tell me about this mind that does the science. Well, the mind is the brain. And what's the brain? Well, it's the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I say, pardon? If you knew that your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, you wouldn't trust it for one minute, would you? <laughs> And yet you're telling me that this instrument is reliable. Now this argument isn't new to me. Darwin used it and it bothered him extremely. And the most recent work on it is by a brilliant American philosopher, at least I, I've loved the book, uh, by Thomas Nagel in New York, Mind and Cosmos. Listen to the subtitle. It is electrically provocative. <laughs> Why the neo-Darwinian view of the universe is almost certainly false. Now, Thomas Nagel is an atheist. He doesn't want there to be a God. But he's pointing out that science done on a reductionistic basis has been successful precisely because we've left the mind out. And he makes the point, if the mind is not reducible to physics and chemistry, then we'll have to do an enormous amount of revising. And that is my instant response. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in the information age. And the irony of the whole thing is that physics now, many physicists are regarding information as a quantity, an entity, that is not reducible to mass and energy. It's not material. Of course it isn't. Its carriers are material. But it is immaterial. And if it's immaterial, that immediately raises the possibility of an immaterial world. And materialism as a philosophy, if not atheism, begins to crumble. So, the very fact that we can do science seems to me to be a pointer that there's an intelligent God. And from the Christian perspective, finally, one can simply say this. Atheism, to my mind, gives me no grounds for trusting my rationality. Christianity gives me limited grounds, possibly, because it says the reason I can partly understand the universe by my mind in here, the universe out there, is that the same God is ultimately responsible for both. Okay, so certainly a lot to respond to. Can you take some time to share your thoughts on the relationship between science, belief, religious faith, but also perhaps respond to some of the things we heard about materialism, reductionism, etc.? Right. Okay, so um, there are questions here that it's important to distinguish, right? And so there's a question whether or not, for example, science disproves the existence of God. And, I don't think that science does. As I say, it seems to me that what's relevant is this key philosophical argument, the argument from evil. But you can ask the question whether or not science bears upon Christian beliefs, right? And I believe that science, interpreting that very broadly to include historical science, including history, bears very strongly upon Christian beliefs, right? Now, I realize that Christians have very different beliefs and so on, right? And so I'm going to refer to some beliefs and some Christians will say, that's irrelevant, right? That's not part of what I believe, right? But let me just mention some, okay, right? And so um, I, I view Genesis 2 as, uh, along with some other things, as uh, providing a pretty good reason for thinking that 
uh, what it's revealing to us is that God, so to speak, intervened in the world to bring in existence to human beings by means of special creation. Now, I realize that many Christians don't believe that. They may accept evolution, uh, especially in its theistic form, okay, right? But um, suppose that one does accept the idea of a special creation, right? Uh, then one thing you want to a collision course with is the idea of common descent. And so I think actually there's very strong evidence uh, that humans are descended from another primate species. Now, uh, in his book, uh, Seven Days That Divide the World and so on, uh, John has a very brief discussion of common descent. And what he says is that, you know, that uh, the commonality, so to speak, between humans and chimps can be explained simply by design, right? You know, if you're trying to create, you know, cats and dogs and so on, they're four-legged, right? And so you've got a, a way of getting cats, right? Why not use it to get dogs as well? But this isn't the crucial uh, point about the evidence for common descent. Uh, there's an excellent book by uh, Daniel, I believe it's Fairchild, uh, called The Relics of Eden, where he sets out that evidence, right? And uh, part of it involves what are called retro elements, and this is a matter of uh, DNA that's not part of the genes. I mean, the genes make up only a small part of the DNA, right? And so once you move outside the genes, you're playing a different ball game, right? Uh, but the first chapter is one of the most interesting. It's called Fusion. And it's focused upon the fact that other primates have 24 uh, pairs of chromosomes, and we humans have only 23. And now initially you might think, gee, that looks like it's uh, good news for the creationist, right? But what did they find? What they found was that chromosome 2 is closely related, very closely indeed, to two chimpanzee chromosomes. And there's an extensive mapping. There are things like centromeres and telomeres, right? No longer functioning as that, right? But the right sort of uh, DNA, right? And so I think that uh, if you read that chapter on fusion, the relics of Eden, I predict you'll think there's a very strong case uh, for the view that uh, uh, humans have a primate ancestor, right? So I think that's, I think that's very strong evidence. The second thing I point out is that uh, the God of the Bible is, as John would agree, a God who intervenes in the world, right? And so uh, you can focus on these interventions. And in some cases, you're going to ask, how likely is it that they really occurred? And so one intervention was the great flood at the time of Noah which uh, was a worldwide flood. The water is above the mountains, according to relevant text and so on, right? I don't know exactly when Noah lived, but a Wikipedia article, not necessarily the most uh, reliable sort of place to look, uh, said that's to be, what, 2500 BC. And so look, suppose it was a worldwide flood in 2500 BC that killed all the animals and so on, except those, those that were on the ark. There should be a significant fossil record of that, right? There isn't, right? One other miracle, famous miracle of the Battle of Jericho, right? Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, and he asked God's assistance, Yahweh's assistance. And what he wanted Yahweh to do was to stop the sun from moving too quickly across the sky, right? And so Yahweh helped and fixed the sun and moon position for something up to a day. Now, if that happened, of course, if you're on the other side of the world, you would notice, right? Uh, and so you would expect worldwide records of this occurrence. But there aren't any, right? Uh, another thing, uh, Jesus put forward certain views. I mean, uh, a friend of mine said the other day that Jesus was basically uh, an apocalyptic rabbi. That's what he was, okay, right? And uh, Jesus had views about what was going to happen in the future. And one of the views was that uh, he would return to earth in the company of God the Father uh, and the angels uh, to judge all men. And so when did he think this would happen? Well, I'll read you only one quote. I have a number. For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will pay every man for what he has done. Now, I suggest that it's a historical fact that that has not occurred, right? It goes on to say, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And another one saying that, this will happen before the disciples have gone through all the towns of Israel and so on, right? Uh, this will happen before this generation has perished, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at other books of the Bible, you'll find that there was a, you constantly see references to the idea that the, 
The second coming of Jesus is something that's going to occur soon. It's now about 2,000 years later, and it hasn't occurred. So Jesus was wrong about something, and something that, rather than being something trivial, is really crucial for the, the Christian vision of the world. One last thing. A number of miracles in the New Testament, and John referred earlier to the importance of those miracles, are cases where uh, Jesus is casting out devils, right? And we're told that uh, these devils, in some cases, were responsible for blindness and deafness, etc., right? Now, is it the case that when you go to medical school, uh, what they say is, look, you're going to learn how to deal with injuries, you're going to learn how uh, to deal with things that involve the things the body breaking down and so on. Uh, you'll learn that there are illnesses which are caused by bacteria and viruses. But there are certain sorts of illnesses and conditions, medical conditions, that you won't learn to treat. And that's because they're caused by demonic possession. And what you should do there is go to your telephone directory and look up a phone number for a nearby exorcist. And that will do the job, right? If there were demons and possessed people, there would be excellent evidence for that. But I haven't seen any such evidence. Well, there's probably a whole lot we could talk about there, but in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to make a very human intervention and uh, move us on to one final question before our Q&A time, and we will have time for some closing remarks where it might be a great opportunity to kind of wrap a bunch of things. I think, that. though, we need to, uh, there's about 200 allegations there. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I, and I no, think no, I'm, 10 or 15. <laughs> I would like to say a little thing about them. Well, I, let, um, Perhaps we can uh, roll that into kind of our well, final. Can I pick one of them? I'll, I'll, I'll we'll do. My, no, my, no, my timekeeper is giving give me an thumbs up. So why don't, why, don't we, uh, why don't we sneak in some? Yes, no. so I'm getting yeah. the thumbs up. Yes, me. because first of all, uh, I'm interested that you're ta thinking about evolution when I'm reading people like Nagel who are questioning the neo-Darwinian synthesis. But we we can't go into that. I'm just going to take one thing because it's very important. Jesus claimed that he would return. And you quoted uh, the statement, there are some of you standing here who shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You did not quote what follows, that after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And that is the fulfillment of it. Notice what he says. There are some of you standing here who will not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God. The normal way to realize that the kingdom of God is real is to die. Nobody will be any doubt about it then. But the point was to convince them of the reality of the kingdom of God before he died. And he did it immediately. He took him up a mountain and he was transfigured. They saw the power of God descend upon him. And Peter, recalling this, said this is what convinced him that the uh, eternity was real and that Christ would come again. In other words, it was a foreshadowing of what would one day happen. So I think he wasn't wrong. The second point is, you said that they expected it to happen soon. The answer that the Bible gives is yes and no. There are two strands in the New Testament. The one emphasizes the soonness and the day you think not and so on. The other is it won't happen. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. But the end is not yet. It will not happen until. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. We move, don't we, at two speeds towards eternity. I might die tonight. And as far as I'm concerned, that is me into eternity. But then there's earth history moving on. And Jesus did not want people to live. Oh, he's not coming for 2,000 years, so I needn't bother. Because when we die, that will be, in one sense, the end of that opportunity. So the two strands are there. So I simply think your interpretation is wrong on that point. Can I respond? I mean, yeah. I have other, I have other, I have other, I have other passages. I Let me read two other passages, right? <laughs> When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Here's a longer quotation. In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, mm -hmm. and the power of heavens will be shaken. And then will they see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. 
And then he will send out the angels and gathers elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. That's Mark 13, 24, 30. There's a similar passage in Matthew 24, 29, 34. Uh, so I think we can take all those passages together. Uh, my interpretation is the more plausible one. Well, actually, oh, that is to happen in the future. And you probably know that the consensus among New Testament scholars is this generation in the sense of this kind of generation, not this actual generation, because it's quite clear from the later apostles that the coming of Christ in power and great glory is coming in the final time. So again, I don't think that Jesus was wrong on that. But this is turning into a theological yeah, right. discussion. <laughs> well, we certainly have a sense of where the, uh, where the debate takes us. Right? Yeah. So we've covered a lot of territory this evening. We've talked about our big understandings, our concepts of Christianity and atheism. We've talked about the problem of evil and our different perspectives on that. We've looked at this relationship between science, faith, empirical evidence, and belief. As we get to our Q&A time, and we will get there, can you briefly make a statement about what it might take to change your mind. So am I going first on this? Uh, well, why not? <laughs> yeah, we just heard from first. Professor Lennox. Why don't, just to kind of provoke us a little bit, as we think about, we've got some strong beliefs and ideas. Give us a sense, if anything, is there counter evidence you would consider? Are there things that might persuade you to change some of these core beliefs that we've been talking about? Okay, so um, th there are two very, very different things here. Sure. Uh, one concerns atheism, and the other concerns my uh, rejection of Christianity, mm -hmm. right? And um, as regards atheism, I, as I've said, I think the crucial thing is the argument from evil, right? And the argument from evil has uh, often been formulated in a way that's unsatisfactory, right? Uh, some people claim, for example, that there was a logical incompatibility between the existence of evil uh, and uh, the existence of a perfectly good uh, deity, right? Uh, I view it as an evidential argument for me. Well, so for me to give up atheism would be involved my being convinced that uh, it turns out there's no satisfactory version of the evidential argument for me. And that's not unthinkable, but I think it's really uh, not very likely. Um, what about what it would it take for me to accept Christianity? Uh, well, that would be a rather longer and more arduous uh, journey. Uh, and um, one is that, uh, on the one hand, there are uh, these beliefs about the occurrence of miracles and so on, demonic possession, etc., uh, that I think there are good scientific and historical reasons for rejecting, right? So I would need to, so to speak, become convinced that I was mistaken on those sorts of matters, right? Um, but my rejection of Christianity also involves moral factors, right? And so uh, I'd have to think, for example, that uh, the moral teaching that one finds in the Bible uh, is actually satisfactory, right? Now, we haven't had a chance to talk about that, okay, right? Uh, I mean, in the Old Testament, you get the death penalty for umpteen things, not being a virgin when you're married, having sex with another man, and so on, right? uh, being a rebellious son, and so on, so you have children think, man, that's not so bad, right? And so on, right? Um, but leave, leave the Old Testament aside, right? And so you get, I mean, in the, in the New Testament, right? Uh, Jesus takes the view that divorce is only acceptable uh, on the grounds of adultery, right? I think if your spouse is beating you up badly all the time, that's grounds for divorce, right? It's also morally wrong to uh, marry the divorced woman and so on, right? But the really crucial things concern these central ideas that you have in Christianity, right? Uh, there's the idea of a final judgment. There's the idea of hell. There's the idea of a sacrificial death, right? And that in particular doesn't seem to me to make any moral sense at all, right? And uh, similarly for original sin, right? I mean, I don't see how what someone did in the distant past, I mean, the you know, first human being, right, should, so to speak, harm me. And especially I don't see how, you know, I can agree with Paul that in Adam all men have sinned, right? If you sinned in Adam, that's guilt, right? I don't see how I can be guilty for what someone did a long, long time ago, right? So it's those sort of special features of Christianity, features that are not present in Islam, by the way, right? Uh, that I find particularly problematic, right? And so 
there'd have to be uh, a very serious change in my attitude there. And I don't want to sound closed-minded, right, but I really can't quite imagine myself coming to believe that even a single very evil human being like Stalin or Hitler or Paul Pott, right, deserves to suffer eternally for something done in a finite period of time, let alone that that's what's going to happen to the majority of the human race. And Professor Lennox, to you, a final thought before we turn it over to our audience. And just uh, well, some I've reflections on what might change your mind. I've spent my life asking myself that question. And I think that I would change my mind if you could convince me that Jesus did not rise from the dead, that God's interaction with Israel did not happen, that many fulfillments of Hebrew prophecy, the timing of the birth of Christ, the place of his birth were just coincidence, that the rise of science had nothing to do with Christianity, that the naturalistic view of getting a universe from nothing was not nonsense, that the warrant for reason and morality can survive the demise of God. I would perhaps change my mind if you could convince me that my experience of God in life is an illusion that the stability of my 45-year marriage has nothing to do with prayer and God, that my sense of fulfillment and peace and forgiveness through Christ is an illusion, that the transformation I've seen in hundreds of people's lives through trusting Christ and changing their worldview is an illusion. Those things would begin to make me change my mind. I listen to Michael say certain things. I, I think that part of the problem in what you were saying at the end is misinterpretation of Scripture. But ladies and gentlemen, the final point I want to make is the, uh, what you mentioned at the end, Michael, the biggest problem, the suffering and evil. We see a ragged world and we see a mixed picture. It's like Coventry Cathedral. There are traces of beauty and there are traces of horrible bomb damage. We can argue till kingdom come what our concept of God might have done with it, but I ask a different question. I say, is there any evidence anywhere in the universe that we can trust God with those ragged edges? One of my answers is the existence of a final judgment, which is a glorious thing because it means that fairness will one day be done throughout this universe and be seen to be done and that our moral conscience will not turn out to have been an illusion. And I firmly believe that if we could now see what God has done with those millions of people who'd never get justice in this world, who perished innocently, if we could see what he's done with them, we would have no more questions. And I trust God with those ragged edges, not because I've got simplistic answers, but because I see the reality of what it means for God in Christ to die on a cross and rise again. Well, thank you both for this discussion. Why don't we take some time now to transition to our attentive and patient audience. Thank you. Okay, so now things get really interesting. Uh, we've heard from two people, now we're going to try to hear from a lot of people. Let me stand up for this, just to uh, direct traffic just a little bit. I imagine so many of you would love to sit down for hours and have a coffee talk with either of our professors. Of course, Lennox is heading out on a flight, and Professor Cooley has limited office hours on campus. So we are going to do our best to accommodate as much as we can. Here's the format. We have our two microphone police up front here. I would ask that you form two basic lines for those who would like to ask a question, and I would beg that you would write something down. They are going to look and see, do you actually have a period or a question mark at the end of what you're writing? And then here's the one unique thing we'd like to do. We are actually going to get several questions on the table before we have a response. Uh, this is a, upon request from both our participants, and we've had great experience with this in the past. So we're going to alternate, we're going to get two or three questions perhaps even three or four from each mic, we're all going to kind of take some notes and then we're going to invite our particip participants to respond to the broad themes that we hear in these questions. It also gives us an opportunity to hear from each other about what our questions are and we get more voices in the conversation. So if you are interested in participating further, we're going to go for about 20 to 25 minutes if we can. 
Why don't we start uh, over here and we will just alternate and we'll take about four or five questions. Once we've hit that, we're going to stop. Our mic police are going to be very attentive to that and we'll turn it over to our participants to address the theme of questions that we've heard. Please go ahead. Okay, so my question is about the resurrection and it's mainly directed to Dr. Lennox. Um, what is the point of being redeemed for our sins by Jesus' death if Jesus was simply resurrected? Doesn't it seem meaningless for our salvation to have him die for our sins but then come back to life? Isn't it like an easy cop-out? Okay, so we have a question about the resurrection on the table. Let's add another one to our conversation. Um, thank you both for uh, having your conversation in front of us today. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Lennox. <laughs> Um, Dr. Tooley briefly mentioned the divine command theory, which I take it to be something like what makes an action morally right or wrong is God having us, having commanded us to do it or forbade us from doing it. Uh, so my question for Dr. Lennox is, why does God command us to do the things that he commands us to do? Okay, thank you. We have divine command theory as part of the conversation. Let's hear from a couple more. Um, so I've got a question. I've never really been explained where God really came from and that he's like always been there and always will be almost. So I kind of want some elaboration on that. And additionally, um, if he did kind of like, I don't want to say sprout out of nowhere, but sprout out of nowhere, how do we know in your words if he's the result of a mindless, unguided process? So okay. That's about so it. where did God come from? Yeah. Yeah. How about one more question on the table before we turn it over to our participants? My question is for Dr. Tooley, and it is, how actively have you sought to find that demonic possessions and miracles don't occur today? Okay, why don't we pause there, microphone police, thank you. We have some ideas about the resurrection, about divine command theory, about where God came from, and contemporary issues of the demonic activity and miracles. So why don't we have both of our participants kind of jump in, perhaps even with each other, on any one or all of those topics. Uh, let me address the, the last question, right? And so, yes, I haven't done careful research on demonic possession, right? But the point is that if there were a case of demonic possession, they could be scientifically investigated. Uh, religious things can be scientifically investigated. For example, uh, this question of whether prayer uh, for the healing whether is efficacious. And there have been experiments done on that, including the one called the STEP, which have generated negative results, right? And so, I mean, if you think they're a case of demonic possession, then you should bring them to the attention of scientists so they can be verified, right? Because that would be striking evidence. I mean, it would be evidence against uh, a certain sort of naturalistic conception of the world, right? It would be quite decisive, in my opinion, right? Um, I mean, again, there's a tendency to accept these things uncritically. So you go back historically, you can read about cases where it appeared that people were demonically possessed, but some people performed experiments, and one experiment involved giving them some water to drink, and they drank it, uh, and were fine, right? Although, you know, they were uh, exhibiting these symptoms. And then there was another, uh, the second part of the experiment was taking some water, which was described as holy water, and throwing it in their direction, in which case all hell broke loose. But they'd been tricked, of course, uh, what they had been drinking was holy water, which they had no reaction to at all, which according to the, the, the theory in the church at the time, they should have, right? And they were reacting to what they thought was holy water, right? So uh, I, I would bet quite heavily that one cannot come up with a case uh, that's a case of demonic possession. But I say, I haven't investigated carefully. My, I, I, I think, Michael, I would agree in the sense that there's an enormous not a lot of spurious claims. That there are people that claim to heal all kinds of things, and they almost generate what they're doing. But my skepticism was reduced greatly by visiting Rwanda. And I talked to some very serious-minded medical doctors. Now, it's not direct evidence, but I talked to many of them who hadn't the slightest doubt that these things were absolutely real. But that's anecdotal. May I have a look at this second last question, which I get a great deal. And it's a very important question, where does God come from? Because it is actually the heart of Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. 
and I'll reformulate it in the way I normally get it. If you believe in God created the world, well then who created the creator? Or where did the creator come from? And then it becomes a reductio ad absurdum, who created the creator, the created the creator, and so on. Well, my approach to that is sheer logic. If you ask the question, who created God? That question presupposes that God was created. But I don't know any Christian, Muslim, or Jew that believes that God was created. God is utterly eternal. So the question, who created him or where did he come from, is actually meaningless because it doesn't apply. So the question is what some philosophers call a complex question in that it conceals an assumption that really rules out understanding the question in the first place. But Dawkins has faced me with this publicly. And so I said, your question is valid for created creators. But it's of no interest with regard to God because created gods, we don't need you to tell us that they're, they're uninteresting because we usually call them idols. But I said, Richard, you believe the universe created you. So if your question is valid, let me ask it to you. Who created your creator? I'm still waiting for the answer to that question. <laughs> now the serious point, and I'm sure Michael will agree, is that we're really asking about ultimate reality. Do these questions go back infinitely in both directions? And I find that most of my friends, whether they're Christian or atheist, they stop. The Christian stops with God as the ultimate reality. And many of my colleagues stop with the universe, the multiverse, mass energy or something like that. It's not that they go on forever. So I just feel that that's one approach to your question. It doesn't, it's not valid for the God of the Bible because he is eternal. Can I comment briefly on that? Please. Yeah, please do. I'd right. love to hear so, you. Uh, I would agree with John, there's nothing uh, intrinsically problematic about the existence of something that's eternal. Yes. Right? It could be God, uh, it could be a physical universe and so on. Uh, but think about the following thing. Imagine that uh, we had reason to believe that uh, the Earth had been around forever and ever and been unchanging, right? And so what we ha would have there, we'd have you know, cows as far back as you wanted to go, right? And that would be though it might be true, would be a very unsatisfying sort of <laughs> view because you have these extremely complex things, right? They haven't developed by evolution, I'm assuming. There's always cows, always cats and dogs, right? So you have these complex organisms, right, that if they haven't developed into simpler things, uh, one's clients say, gee, it's an enormous accident that you have these sorts of things, right? So I think, I think a theory which enables one to reduce complexity and go back to simpler and simpler things is other things being equal, intellectually more satisfying, right? And so I think that that's an aspect. This doesn't show evolution is true, but it's a, it's a plus factor of evolution, right? That you, so to speak, are getting rid of things that are extraordinarily improbable in terms of things that are less improbable. So I think the question that Dawkins should be asking is whether or not uh, it's reasonable to think that God is complex or simple, right? Oh, he does ask that question. Oh, I see, he does ask Oh, absolutely. Okay, right. No. Uh, and you give me a chance to say something about yeah. it. Yes, uh, he does ask that question because the two questions are related. Uh -huh. The one is who created the creator. The other is, look, um, introducing God at any point is absurd because God is by definition more complex than the thing you're explaining and therefore is no explanation at all. Now, that is actually the more interesting question. Uh -huh. And I agree with you, that's the question he should be asking, but he does ask it, and here's my answer to it. I say reductionism works very well, but it has limits. And of course it's satisfying to be able to give simpler elements that generate the more complex thing, but there's one notable exception. And I put it to Dawkins directly. I said, Richard, that works very well, but there's certain things it doesn't work for. I, I picked up a book and I found it was called The God Delusion. It's 400 pages long, it's pretty complex. So I asked what was its origin. And I discovered its origin was in the infinitely more complex mind of Richard Dawkins. So I dismissed that <laughs> since the explanation was more complex than the thing I was explaining. <laughs> Now, the serious point, I'm glad you laugh, you see the point. Um, the serious point here, ladies and gentlemen, is 
The one immediate exception we make to reductionism, all of us, whether scientists or not, is the moment we see something with a semiotic dimension, like writing on a page. You've only got to see a few words up on the screen if there is one over there. And you immediately infer an intelligent input, a top-down causation. Whatever the mechanical, automatic processes that have gone on to produce that in the screen, you know intelligence is involved. You always do that with the semiotic dimension. And one of my arguments, which I haven't used tonight, but it's a very important argument, is we've lived to find the longest word that we've ever imagined possible. It's the human genome. 3.5 billion letters long in a four-letter genetic alphabet with a semiotic dimension. It codes for the proteins. We see a single word up there, um, veritas. We infer intelligence. We watch 3.5 billion letters, and what do we say? Chance and necessity. There's something very curious about that. Very curious indeed. And that really brings me back to the difference between our worldviews. As a scientist, I believe the worldview that starts within the beginning was the word. Makes more sense than the one that starts in the beginning was mass energy. So that's how I'd respond to that. Yes, I agree, but there's one notable exception, and it's at the heart of the discussion today. Can I, can I comment on the first question, actually? Or sure, that... let's get one more response, and then we'll right. see if we can get some other okay, topics good. in, in so, I mean, discussion. The first here. question focused upon the sacrifice of Jesus, and uh, part of it was that it didn't look like a very great sacrifice because you know, you're on the cross and you die, and then you're resurrected and so on, right? But I, I think there's a more important moral problem here that needs to be brought out. And uh, I can do it in terms of an analogy, okay? So suppose that Bruce is a schoolboy, and he steals the teacher's apple, right? And Harold, his teacher, finds out uh, that he's stolen the apple. And I'm thinking back to maybe 1950s in England and New Zealand and Australia, where children got caned in school, right? And so Harold yes. says, Bruce, you're going to have to be caned for stealing my apple, right? But Bruce has a friend, let's call her Allie, right? And Allie says, uh, please don't cane uh, Bruce, right? Uh, you can cane me instead, right? And the headmaster say, ah, oh, great idea, Ali, that works, okay? And so uh, Bruce, so to speak, has escaped from the punishment he would otherwise deserve because of a sacrifice that someone else makes. Now, it seems to me at the human level, right, in terms of this example, that's just morally pretty crazy, right? But it's at the heart of Christianity, the idea that if this innocent person who is both God and man died on the cross, and if we then freely acknowledge his sacrifice and so on, then we're in good shape, okay? But it seems to me that the basic idea is morally very problematic. I don't think okay. so. Let me give you another well, let, let's, uh, I, I, think you, I know, I know, I, I have to. He's, we're going to turn, turn the mic over. Argument, get a few more argument by analogy is very on the dangerous. Table here. I only need one uh, sentence. All right, this, uh, this question is for Dr. Lennox. Uh, Dr. Tooley briefly mentioned the problem of common descent. So how do we simultaneously uh, look at the science of common descent and understand the belief that God created us in his image? Okay, so we have a, a topic of common descent in relation to God's creation. Uh, why don't we get another topic on the table here? My question is for Dr. Lennox. Um, the question is, what is the Bible? And uh, do you think it's infallible and literal, or do you think it's possible that it's fallible and figurative? Okay. So fallibility of the Christian Bible. I would ask both of the uh, 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 men here, if we reject the existence of God, do we not create a crisis in meaning? And if so, then why don't we see more philosophers like Nietzsche, Sartre, and Foucault, and those types? Okay, crisis of meaning, and the question behind that. And how about one more? Hey, Dr. Lennox, my question is for you. It's about, uh, it's relating to the conversation you two had about the hurricane. Why do you need life after death in order to find validity in your own life? Does that make life meaningless if there is no life after death? Okay, thank you. So some questions about life after death, crisis of meaning, the fallibility of the Bible, and common descent. 
How much time do we got? <laughs> oh, five minutes. Okay. Well, that's easy. So, please, whoever would like to jump in on uh, either of those topics. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of evidence for the uh, fallibility of the Bible. Uh, something that hasn't come up is that there's good reason for thinking, for example, that uh, Genesis uh, is a combination of at least two sources. Some scholars think many more, okay, right? And you get the so-called higher biblical criticism. But uh, if you look at, for example, the story of Noah, and uh, if you keep track of the word that's being used to refer to God, whether it's Yahweh or something else and so on, right? And this will appear in the translation, right? You can actually separate the story of Noah out into two stories, which are on their own perfectly consistent and straightforward stories, right? But you find that they disagree with one another, right? And one of the things they disagree about is the number of animals of certain sorts to be taken on the ark, okay? Uh, in the one story, it's a pair of each type of animals. Uh, in the other story, it's, for example, I think seven birds and so on, right? So there are contradictions in uh, the story of Noah, and uh, they're nicely explained by uh, the fact that it's a combination of two stories and so on, right? Uh, I also mentioned that you have these claimed miracles, and this is quite crucial because John wants to appear, appeal to the miracles of the New Testament, especially the great miracle of the resurrection of Jesus, right? But what you need to do is you need to ask, and another question you need to ask is about the reliability of the Bible as a whole when it puts forward miracle stories, right? And again, I think that various miracles are described in the Old, Old Testament, the, the worldwide flood, uh, the uh, slaughter of the, all the firstborn Egyptian children and so on, right? Uh, the sun standing still, Joshua, Jared. I think there are actually reasons for those event, that those events did not take place. And so it seems to me that if you look at more of those things, you can build up a strong case for the fallibility of the Bible and its unreliability when it de deals with uh, miracle stories. Okay. Some thoughts on the conversations on the table for this round? Well, uh, this would require an entire evening. The fact that there are different sources is not an argument of, of fallibility. For example, Luke says explicitly he researched many different sources. Uh, that doesn't mean that his book is full of error. And the arguments from the old source criticism that you quote, if you read, say, Jack Collins, who's uh, one of the leading Hebrew scholars in America, I think you'd find serious disagreement with your interpretation of the Noah narrative. But I'd like to just concentrate on um, the, uh, let's see, which, which one of these, because there were so many. Um, let me have a look. On the literal side, by the way, somebody asked about taking the Bible literally. Nobody takes it literally. Jesus said, I am the door. <laughs> <laughs> I think the word literal, uh, I mean this quite seriously, the word literal is hopelessly inadequate. Because you see, when Jesus said, I am the door, he's not a literal door, but he's a real door. He's literal one level up. And the Bible, like any other work of literature, is full of metaphor. So if you say, as many people ask me, do I take it literally? Yes, I do, at that base level, whatever is literal. Israel was a land flowing with milk and honey. Do I take that literally? <laughs> that the Israelites, when they came into the land, met a, met a great sticky mess of milk and honey <laughs> belting down the main street. No, 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 I, you take it spiritually. Israel was a land full of the milk of the Word of God and the honey of the Holy Spirit. Nonsense. Israel was a land. That's literal. The milk and honey were literal. The metaphor is flowing, but it's standing for a reality. So we must treat the Bible not as less than a book, but as more than a book. But let me just make a comment on, uh, on this issue of um, the crisis in meaning rejecting the existence of God and does life after death, its absence, empty life from meaning. Of course it doesn't empty life from meaning because we humans are inventive. We can create meanings for ourselves, but it empties it of ultimate meaning. And I'm very interested in the earlier writers like Nietzsche and Sartre and Camus, because that's in a way where I learned my atheism. And I still have no reason to doubt that Nietzsche was right, that when you, if you reject God, in the end, he said, people will discover 
that they've rejected all values and they've destroyed humanity. They are what's called hard atheists. I called Richard Dawkins a soft atheist. He wants to retain the values of a Western liberal democracy and at the same time espouse atheism. And yet he himself says that his atheism leads to saying there is no good, there is no evil, there is no justice, DNA just is and we dance to its music. But if that's true, the bombers that flew the planes into the Twin Towers were dancing to the music of their DNA. That's an end of all morality. And that's an, that is an example of contemporary hard atheism. But because Dawkins is a moral being, from my perspective made in the image of God, he rejects that. And he says, but we must rebel against our selfish genes, which makes many of his atheist colleagues laugh, who are philosophers, and said, if we are our selfish genes, what non-material principle have we got to rebel against them? So I think there is a crisis of meaning, and I think it'll grow worse. Any thoughts on this idea of crisis of meaning? Uh, yeah, I don't agree with it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so I've read Camus and Sartre and other people with enjoyment, right? But not generally with much illumination, right? And so, I mean, the thing is, if you look at contemporary philosophy, look at people who are working in the area of ethics, specifically in the area of meta-ethics, right? And what you find is that uh, there are uh, enormous number of uh, excellent philosophers who are defending uh, sometimes different views uh, on so to speak, what account is to be given of objective value, right? And so I mentioned earlier uh, my colleague Graham Audie, who has this book, Value, Desire, and Reality, right? By real and desire, I always have trouble with the order of the title. But anyhow, uh, he takes the view that, uh, uh, that uh, desiring things is, so to speak, uh, a perception that may be uh, an erroneous perception, right, of goodness, right? And so uh, he has an account of, uh, of what goodness is and uh, how we can come to uh, uh, have knowledge of the existence of good things. And it's sort of, I say, a perceptual model, but it's, the idea is that desire is, so to speak, a form of perception. My other colleague who has done extensive work in this area is Mike Humer, and he defends ethical intuitionism. This is a theory that, uh, again, uh, I'm not an expert on Greek philosophy, right, but it seems to me that it's rather related to the views that Plato put forward. And historically, there have been a number of defenders of it, including H.A. Uh, Pritchard, for example, then G.E. Moore at the beginning of the, the 1900s and so on, and W.D. Ross, right? And the idea is that Ethical truths are necessary truths, just to say the truths of mathematics and arithmetic are right. And the idea is that one can, so to speak, in contemplating those propositions, one can, so to speak, have intuitive insight into the truth of them, right? And uh, I think that's a uh, perfectly uh, interesting and uh, promising uh, theory, right? And it, if it's right, it gives you a very strong objectivity because the idea is that the basic ethical truths, it can be some that are derived, right? Basic ethical truths are necessary truths, right? And one of the problems with uh, a theistic approach to value is that uh, I think there are reasons for thinking, for example, that uh, the existence of an omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect being is not logically necessary. If it were logically necessary, then there'd be reason for thinking that something like Anselm's ontological argument should be available, right? But no one, I think, has found a satisfactory version, right? So it seems to me that there, there are good reasons for thinking there are possible worlds where there is no omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect being, right? But if values were based upon God, then uh, moral principles, so to speak, would not be true in all possible worlds, but only in some, right? And so I think that's a serious objection to a theistic approach to value. I'm looking at my handlers here. Do we have time for one more round of four? And I'm getting the no. So uh, my apologies. You can blame me. I'll be the bad guy. Those of you who are in line, Give your name to the program directors in the back. When we come back here in a couple years and do this all again, you'll be the first at the microphone for the questions. <laughs> okay. uh, with that, we, have, we are going to invite our participants to give a brief closing statement on their reflections of this evening, the topic, and really what you should take away from our conversation together. I don't know that we had chosen who would like to go first, but perhaps we'll start. Okay. Um. Okay, well, um, one of the main things I would hope is that people will leave here feeling that uh, the question that John and I have uh, been discussing, not always agreeing on the answers, but are really very important questions, and that as a result, that one should 
uh, devote time oneself and attempt to get to uh, the bottom of these issues. Now, uh, we live in a world where there are many things that compete for our time. I'm thinking of social media like Facebook, for example. And I think it's very easy to get caught up in spending one's time in ways that uh, are not really very valuable. So I think it's important to say to oneself, these questions about the nature of reality and these choices such as that between atheism and Christianity are really absolutely crucial choices. And I need to make sure that I set aside time to think seriously about them. It's important, however, not to cast one's net too narrowly. John and I, in our conversation tonight, have been focusing on atheism and Christianity because one of us is an atheist and he is a Christian, so it's a very natural focus. Uh, but especially in a society where most people are Christians, uh, it's very easy to think in terms of just those two options. But the world has many religions other than Christianity. I think it's very important to have those other alternatives on the table as well. In addition, however, it's natural living in the Western world uh, to think in terms of the great monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. This, I think, is a mistake. It seems to me that the great religions of the East are very worthy of serious examination. Indeed, Buddhism as a religion has often struck me as very appealing in many ways. And if I had to recommend a historical religion, I prefer not to, uh, but it would be Buddhism. How does one think about the alternatives in a productive fashion? Well, first of all, one needs to learn about different religions. To do that, one needs to read some good books in comparative religion. Now, these are not, I think, that easy to find, since many books suffer from serious biases or an outlook that's insufficiently philosophical or insufficiently critical. There's a book that I would recommend. It was written by a philosopher with a very fine critical mind, and that was a book written by one of my own teachers, Walter Kaufman, uh, Religions in Four Dimensions. Secondly, there are truly extraordinary books that deal with religion, many of which were written actually in the 19th century, in comparison to which I think a lot of contemporary books are rather thin indeed. Here I'm thinking of books such as The History of European Morals, written by W.H. Leckie, History of Warfare, Science with Theology and Christendom, written by A.D. White. So don't confine your reading, in short, to today's often ephemeral offerings. Seek out truly great scholars uh, of the past. Thirdly, both science and philosophy are usually very relevant to many philosophical views. So you should try to expose yourself to the crucial scientific and philosophical ideas and bring those to bear in a serious way upon the questions you're thinking about. Finally, I know from my own experience that the idea of thinking critically about one's religious views may not seem like an easy step, since it's possible that you may come to feel, as I did at one point in my life, that one's current views are problematic. And if you follow uh, through on that feeling, you may find yourself traveling along a very different path from the one that you have been on. But if that happens to you as a result of your thinking critically about the issues that we have been discussing tonight, I want to say, do not fear. I'm confident you will find that the journey, however unnerving it may sometimes seem, will be very rewarding in the end. Thank you. Thank you.